Hello and welcome to the fourth part of the tutorial on writing your own operating system. Um, so in the last video we have started uh, going towards communicating with the hardware, right? So um, of course the first thing we want to do is uh, we want to talk to the keyboard. So this is your keyboard. Okay, it's drawn a little bit bad. And here's your CPU. Um, okay, now when you press a key on the keyboard, um, there will go, uh, there will be a signal which will go to the programmable interrupt controller. Pick. And, um, well, the, the thing is the programmable interrupt controller will just ignore that. Okay? And, if we want to receive this key strike, we have to tell the PIC to uh, to not ignore it, and uh, so we have to send some data there. So before we really start with uh, with the back and forth communication between the CPU and the hardware, uh, we really have to uh, to uh, to have a method of talking to the hardware, right? So we need a way to send data out and to receive data. Okay, and then the, the interrupts that we will deal with in the next video, they will tell us when there is data to receive. Okay? So, um, technically, um, the CPU has a, a, a multiplexer and a demultiplexer. Um, which is uh, connected to different, uh, all different uh, hardwares. So you don't really need to know that uh, in order to understand what we are doing here. This uh, multiplexer and demultiplexer, they are really, uh, uh, if you know a little bit about uh, about all the hardware design, right, then uh, this just means that uh, you can put a number in here and then uh, the multiplexer or demultiplexer will uh, will send data to uh, to the port with that number or receive data from the port with that number. Okay, so the PIC, for example, has the number, I think, 32, so 0x20. So we would have to send data to port 0x20. Okay, and, uh, well, in assembler there is a simple uh, instruction which is just called uh, out B. And out B would get two um, parameters, the port number, and yeah, uh, the data that you want to send there. Um, but this is in, uh, this is assembler, and we are not programming this in assembler, right? So um, yeah, when when you have um, when you read source codes on the internet, uh, you will often see um, relatively simple uh, methods of doing that, um, like uh, they they will just wrap this code, this assembler code, basically uh, like this. As a direct call to assembler and then just uh, have a global function for this, also called out B. Okay, so the problem with that is, uh, in my opinion, this isn't really uh, an object-oriented way of doing it, right? Because uh, in order to use this port, now you need to know the port number and you need to know the bandwidth of the port. You know, you have different uh, um, different ports with different bandwidths. So uh, without B, you send a single byte and here you get a single byte. And then uh, there's also out W for 16-bit uh, integers and out L for 32-bit integers. Um, and on the outside, when when you talk to the port, you're not really interested in the bandwidth, right? So 
you don't want to know that, but if you want to talk to a port like this, you have to know it. And I don't think that's good design. So the object-oriented design would be um, to have some object, a port object, which knows its bandwidth, which knows its port number, and then you just have uh, two methods, uh, read and write. Okay, and then, um, well, 8-bit ports will have a write method uh, which takes uh, uint 8t, right? 16 bits will have uint 16. So if you if you really send, uh, if, if you try to send a, an 8-bit uh, integer to a 16-bit port, that's no problem because the a uh, compiler will, will then say, okay, this is 8-bit, but uh, I cannot, there, there is no version with 8-bit on a 16-bit port, but there is a 16-bit port, so I will just uh, turn this 8-bit integer into a 16-bit integer. So it's not your problem at this point anymore, right? Whether it's 8-bit or 16-bit. Uh, you can get one problem if you try to send 16-bit integers to an 8-bit port, but um, this at least... Um, will not, uh, I mean, this will not really cause a problem. The, only the compiler will, will tell you, hey, this is not legal. You are doing something wrong. Okay. So uh, the compiler will not even let you do this uh, in a wrong way. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, so let's program this. Um, I admit this, uh, <laughs> this is a bit boring. So uh, I'll try to do this fast. So you don't get uh, too bored. Um, so we'll create two more files, port.h and port.cpp. So usual protection. We need the types again, of course. Okay. So now we will have a class for, uh, basically a, a base class for ports, which uh, knows its, uh, its own port number. And the port number is always a 16-bit integer, so... This needs to be protected. Um, and the constructor will also be protected so that we cannot instantiate this because it's a purely virtual uh, base class. Okay, um, then we will have an 8-bit port, A constructor port 8-bit. Destructor, and then we will have a write method. Okay. I'll just have two copies of this, and uh, to sp uh, to save some time, uh, I will just search replace um, 
the number 8 with the number 16. And down here I will replace the number 8 with the number 32. Okay. Um, and I will also make another port version, which is also 8 bits, but it's a bit slower than the other 8-bit ports, so this will need its own write version. Uh, by the way, I'll make, I'll make these methods all virtual. So the other 8-bit port is going to be 8 bits slow. And it uh, it extends the 8-bit port. Um, it will inherit the read method, so we don't have to overwrite that. Um, okay, like this. Okay. So now let's go into the port CPP. And implement all these things. So the constructor of the base class will just uh, store the port number the constructor of the 8-bit port will just uh, fall back on the base constructor Okay, so the write method um, will um, just use the assembler uh, code. And the read will uh, have some RAM for the result, uh, which it returns in the end, and in between.
Okay, so this looks good. So I'll just copy this. And search replace the number 8 with the number 16 again. And here the number 8 was the number 32. Okay, and then we just have to replace the assembler uh, calls without W in W out L and in L and then have uh, also the version for the slow 8-bit So the read um, for the slow 8-bit ports is inherited, so we only overwrite the write version um, by just adding uh, two garbage instructions behind to make the um, to make the program wait a little until the port is done writing the data. So. Um, So this should be it. Then put it also in the make file. Now let's see. Okay, so this uh, seems to work. Um, now this was uh, relatively easy and uh, it didn't take much time. So I think uh, we have some time left so that uh, we can do two more little things. Um, in the make file I will, um, I will put another uh, make target Uh, the clean target. This is uh, this is really a, a standard target. You see this in make files all the time. And this simply uh, deletes uh, the generated object files and also the my kernel bin and my kernel. Also. So um, when you call make clean now, 
it simply deletes uh, all the object files and all the generated files and uh, only leaves the uh, the source files you know the thing that the things that you've really written um, so uh, and then you can just say make run again and of course it generates everything again so um, this is really a uh, something handy to have and uh, as I said this is really uh, common practice, you see this in make files all the time. Um, another thing that I think uh, we have the time for now is the printf. Um, because this printf is actually pretty stupid right now, um, because if you, if you called it twice, Well, what happens, you still get the same text only once. And that's not really what you want, right? If you uh, call printf twice, you want to have the text twice. And the reason for this is because uh, every time we call printf, well, it starts uh, writing to the first uh, location of the video memory again, right? And uh, so uh, let's use... Yeah, basically something like a cursor. And let's make these static. And then we just, um, yeah, we, we don't write to the ith memory location, but to the memory location of the cursor, and then we move the cursor after that, okay? So how do we compute the location of the cursor in the memory. Well, the screen is 80 uh, characters wide and 25 high. And <laughs> if you remember the old days of DOS programming, then this 80 times 25 is probably very familiar, right? So um, to compute the memory location, we just have to say 80 times y plus x. 80 times y plus x. Then we increase x. And if x uh, is now behind the right border of the screen, then uh, we do a line feed by increasing y and setting x to 0. And then, um, yeah, what happens if the screen is full, if we have reached uh, the bottom of the screen? Then, okay, this isn't really a good idea, but uh, we will just clear the screen and start from uh, the top again, okay? Okay, so now we overwrite, um, so we, we go through the whole screen and uh, reset everything to, uh, to just an empty space character, right? Um, okay, so um, one more thing I want to do is... Um, Um, right now we don't um, we don't use a line feed for example so a backslash n so um, if the ith character in the string is a backslash n then we really want to make a line feed because this isn't uh, really exactly uh, pretty so um, and and you really want to have that when you uh, call printf right so um, yeah let's do this like this. So 
So let's have this just as a default case to actually put the thing on the screen. And in case it's a backslash n, um, Yeah, we do the same thing we do here. So we set x to 0 and increase y. Okay, so now we, we only really print the real characters. Um, And the backslash n will uh, just cause a line feed. And uh, if this line feed goes beyond the border of the screen, then uh, we will still be uh, handle. We will still clean the screen, and uh, because the the case down here will then apply. Okay. Now we have the output twice. And now we have it in two different rows. So I think this is, uh, I mean, of course, this isn't a really exactly great uh, printf. Um, but at least it now behaves a little bit more like we would expect it, right? Um, so this should be enough for now. Um, tune in next time. Next time we will really start uh, talking to the pick and um, uh, then we will actually receive um, data from the hardware through the uh, interrupts. Um, so tune in next time, and don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss the next video. See you next time.